For every beloved video game, whether from our current generation or ones of the past, there are plenty which have proved equally as disappointing. <laughs> But in the case of 1982's E.T., it is not only regarded as one of the worst games ever made, but has also been blamed for the downfall of the once market-dominating Atari and the 1983 video game industry crash as a whole. But like many legends, the truth lies somewhere in between. In 1947, the world's first interactive electronic game was invented, called the cathode ray tube amusement device. And while further evolutions of electronic games appeared over the years, it was in 1958 when what most regard as the first video game solely for entertainment purposes debuted as Tennis for Two, with another more widely circulated game appearing three years later called Space War. Gentlemen, we're about to witness the greatest miracle of the machine age. However, it wouldn't be until the early 1970s when the gaming industry truly began, starting with the first coin-operated arcade games and the release of the first commercial video game console ever made called the Magnavox Odyssey. You attach Odyssey to your television set in seconds to create a closed-circuit electronic playground. But it was the unprecedented success of Pong, along with its eventual 1975 home version, that many regard as what officially launched the game industry into mainstream success, despite a lawsuit from Magnavox for ripping off their original table tennis game. One of today's greatest marketing triumphs in the entertainment field is video games. And in 1977, Atari produced their own standalone video game console, the Atari Video Computer System, or 2600 as later renamed. And with the help of Adventure, the first action adventure and fantasy video game, the Atari 2600 became the best-selling console and Christmas gift in general of 1979. And after licensing the massively popular Space Invaders the following year, Atari quickly became a household name and the king of video game entertainment, producing an extensive line of successful titles and before long owned 80% of the video game market. Show me the money! And in July of 1982, at the height of their success, Atari acquired the rights to produce a video game adaptation of the massive box office success and critically hailed E.T. the Extraterrestrial for a then monumental 20 to 25 million dollars. And hired to design the game was Howard Warshaw, who was specifically requested by Steven Spielberg himself, riding off the recent success of Yar's Revenge and the Raiders of the Lost Ark adaptation. However, there was a catch, as part of the deal hinged on the game being ready for the Christmas shopping season of 1982, giving Warshaw only five to six weeks compared to the usual six to nine months to develop the game from start to finish. Nevertheless, he accepted the challenge, and with final approval from Steven Spielberg, he completed the game on time. I've seen the final game. Oh yeah, yeah, it's my favorite. Of course, I'm biased. I made the movie. As predicted, the game was a highly anticipated and sought-after item of the holiday season, and upon its late November 1982 release, the game was initially a commercial success, even reaching number three of Billboard magazine's top 15 games list of December 1982. Video game? But once people actually played the game, its absurdly rushed production became painfully clear as it was considered punishingly difficult, boring, and lackluster in almost every way. Unsurprisingly, the game's success came to a screeching halt, and it's estimated that around 3.5 million of the 4 million copies produced were sent back to the company, which included customer returns. I think I want my money back. And it's from here that many legends have been formed about E.T.'s impact on Atari and the gaming industry as a whole, as not only did the company see a drastic $536 million loss by the end of 1983, but the following year, the company was divided and sold off. And as part of the legend, out of sheer embarrassment, Atari had the 3.5 million unsold copies of the game buried in a New Mexico landfill. But E.T. isn't just blamed for Atari's collapse, but also coincided with the beginning of the Great North America video game crash of 1983, as while the gaming industry's revenue had peaked at $3.2 billion that same year, it drastically fell to $100 million just two years later. 
but in reality, one of the major catalysts of these series of unfortunate events can be traced back to 1979, when a group of Atari programmers and designers mistreated by the company left to form Activision, which became the first ever third-party game developer. Do you have ice hockey by Activision? Think you are ready for it? A short time later, due in part to a failed lawsuit from Atari to block the unlicensed reproduction of its cartridge format, there was a massive boom in third-party game development, as suddenly any company can make a game for the console, regardless of quality, resulting in an oversaturation of titles, but not just for Atari. I bet it's great doing all those television commercials. I bet you get to keep all the games. By 1983, the market had become flooded with consoles from companies hoping to cash in on the gaming craze, overwhelming consumers with far too many choices, and with a continued abundance of unlicensed third-party games released on multiple systems, no one console manufacturer could succeed, eventually putting many out of business, which in turn left retailers unable to return excess inventory, forcing them to slash prices left and right, creating an even more damaging effect on the game industry. When it comes to video games, nobody compares to Atari. I find Intellivision more sophisticated and lifelike. Gentlemen, move over for my friend Vic. Also in the mix was the rise of affordable home computers, which could not only rival consoles and gaming capabilities, but began to appear to consumers as a more practical investment with applications beyond just gaming. It entertains, educates, manages, it's expandable and affordable. As far as Atari, while E.T. was disastrous for the company less than a year earlier, they had made the same mistake in rushing and overproducing the much-anticipated port of Pac-Man, resulting in customer returns and millions of unsold copies. And by 1983, the company was facing further losses from rival companies making adapters to play their games, along with unsuccessful product launches and the cancelled Atari Cosmos, all of which contributed to their continued dwindling market share. That's not right! How can the price be going down. Something's wrong. But perhaps the final nail in their coffin would be their decision to back out of a partnership deal at the last minute to produce the first American console and games of Nintendo. <laughs> And while a short time later, Atari did in fact bury thousands of copies of E.T. in a New Mexico landfill, as revealed in a 2015 documentary, the game was only a fraction of the 700,000 games buried, simply in an effort to clear out a massive inventory of unsold games and equipment. And while less than 1% of the total games buried were uncovered, E.T. only consisted of around 10% of the games found. The notion that E.T caused the demise of Atari is simply stupid. It's just stupid. But perhaps the most ironic element of this entire story is that while the collapsed Atari Nintendo deal and gaming industry crash pushed Nintendo's debut of an American system, it lent a big hand to their success, despite video games having been labeled as a passing fad. You came a thousand miles just for this game? I've done seven stores a day for three weeks now, and I cannot find it. As with Nintendo having the luxury of watching from the sidelines, they designed the American version of their Japanese Famicom console to resemble and load games akin to a VCR, to avoid association with previous consoles, and made sure to place strict regulations on outside developers, which included the implementation of a lockout chip system that made it nearly impossible for unlicensed games to work on their console. These methods worked so well that Nintendo would eventually control nearly 90% of the gaming market. So to please the kids, they line up at the few stores that have been able to get copies of the hottest Nintendo games. Ironically, in 19 1988, Atari managed to get a hold of the source code of the lockout design and produced a series of unlicensed games for the NES. And just four years later, Atari would sue Nintendo on the grounds of monopolizing the gaming market, with the core ultimately siding with Nintendo. At the end of the day, E.T. is a prime example of what happens when quantity and sales is placed over quality, and was simply a byproduct of the growing trends leading to the gaming industry's inevitable collapse. And while it's easy to dismiss those who predict another game industry downfall with the increasingly saturated market of mobile and downloadable games, along with instances of games being rushed out the door or requiring a growing amount of downloadable content to complete the experience, only time will tell whether the past will one day repeat itself. So what about you? 
what's the worst video game you've ever played? Also, if you'd like to help support the making of future videos, feel free to check out my Patreon and shop in the description. As always, thank you guys and gals so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.